child of God. Love it. Good morning, church. Good to see you. Jason, that is one of my all-time favorite songs. There is a chord in there. That second, what is that chord? It's a, uh, uh, you unravel me with a mallet. Right there. It's like B minor set. Oh, my goodness. It's like honey. Oh, love it. No, it's not a test. Sorry. Although I must admit, I was a little distracted with your female drummer today. I had my eye on, on her over there. <laughs> it don't matter. It's all good. Yeah, oh, by the way, for those who are busy, that's my wife. Thank you, Jason. Yes, I might want to explain that. That is my wife. Sorry. Whew. You know, you got you to gotta be clear these days. I'll tell you what. Today's going to be good. We're going to be, I love you, baby. How are you? You look, you look nice today. We're just going to have a little talk right here, just me and you. Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter, let's get this on the rails, here we go. There was a movie that came out a few weeks ago uh, starring Tom Holland and uh, Mark Wahlberg, Uncharted. Anybody see it? You know, it's, yeah, 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 whatever, I know, they're cute, whatever. These guys played a character, the guy on the left, who's also Spider-Man, I believe, was the great, 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 great grandson of Sir Francis Drake, the great explorer. Does that ring a bell? Everybody remember him, like 500 years ago, something like that? Sir Francis Drake, when he explored the world like 500 years ago, the world was largely uncharted. Everything was kind of up for grabs, you know, like a little nebulous. We think we know this is some coastlines and stuff, but by and large, we were still unsure about a lot of things. So Sir Francis Drake was attempting to recruit a number of new recruits, some young men that he was hoping would be hungry for adventure, to come and join him for an up, uh, upcoming expedition, an exploration of the unknowns. So he gathered them around. He was so excited, and they were hanging on every word. And he told the group that if they would just sign up to come with him, they would see some of the most marvelous things that their eyes had ever beheld. They would see sandy white beaches, new exotic fruits that were so juicy, your flavors it would just pop in your mouth, foreign lands. You would see new, new horizons, priceless treasures, breathtaking landscapes. And then when he said, okay, who's with me? Not a single young man signed up. Can you believe that, Josiah? Can you believe that? Not a single young man. Sir Francis Drake was devastated. He goes home or to his little tent, his little hut, whatever it was. And he's thinking, what was wrong? How did I blow this? Why did they not sign up for Life of Adventure? So I'm going to try something different tomorrow. So a new group of recruits shows up. They gather in tons of young men hungry for adventure. And he says, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. If you come with me, you will encounter storms that will terrify you to tears. If you come with me, there will be fierce winds that hammer us, blow our ship so far off course, you will think we are lost forever. Water and food will be scarce. There will be times that you will be so thirsty, your very souls will cry out just a drop of water. In short, your very lives will be in danger. But if you are willing to go through that, I can promise you nothing less than the adventure of a lifetime. Anyone interested? Every single person signed up to join him on the adventure. Every single person, in fact, some, according to legend, were so fired up to join him for this life of adventure, they didn't even go home to say goodbye to their families. They simply followed him and boarded the ship. What changed? What was different? I mean, think about this. I mean, what, you think the first group that turned down the mission was a bunch of wimps? Was the second group more adventurous than the other? The answer is probably not. It's not the men who had changed, it was the message. Did you catch the difference? Do you see what he did? The first one kind of spoke of rewards and all the easy uh, life that would come, but the second one spoke of, very honest, the challenges. The first one talked about comfort and a life of ease and, and, and treasure and you'll be rich beyond your wildest dream. The second one was very straightforward and said, eh, you're probably going to suffer. <laughs> I'm going somewhere spiritual with this, you know it. That first one offered things. But the second one enticed them with an adventure and an experience unlike any they had ever seen. I wonder if Sir Francis Drake had discovered what Jesus knew all too well. And that is, if you're going to take the narrow road, the road 
far few people choose. If you're going to take the narrow road, it better offer us something far greater than the mundane life most people settle for that broad road that everybody's marching toward. If you're going to take the narrow road, if you're going to take those paths, if that's what's being offered, it needs to be something that promises something greater, something that will shape us, give us hope, give us purpose, something that will build our character, right? Something that will change the way we view the world. It better appeal to our soul if you expect us to be all in. And that's what Jesus offers. Sometimes I think, guys, we have blown it with modern Christianity. I think we've misunderstood and misrepresented sometimes what it is that Jesus is calling us to. Nowhere in Scripture does it talk about a life of ease. That is foreign to Scriptures. I think we've presented it as something so sterile, so clean, so boring, almost irrelevant. Well, all the while, when you look at the pages of Scripture, what Jesus is really calling us to is the challenge in an adventure of a lifetime. So if last week we looked at an authentic faith, today we're going to look at an adventurous faith. And the first truth I want us to grasp is that we begin looking at the adventure of the unknown. That is what Jesus is calling us to. It's radical, and it's scary, and no two days are probably the same. As we see when he starts calling some of these disciples in Mark chapter 1. Look at verse 16 with me. I'm going to read from the ESV. While you follow along, let me welcome our online guests, those who are at home recovering. God bless you. We're praying for you. Glad you could join us across the miles. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16, the scripture says this. So passing along the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, that's the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Okay, great, makes sense, no duh there. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Okay, it's a play on words. If you're new to this, there's a play on words that you're going to see all throughout Scripture. Okay, fishing for men, no longer for fish. And after some consultation, taking a vote, taking a poll, and consulting with many people to see if it was... No? What does yours say? Right away, immediately, straight away. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. And it happens again, going on a little farther. He sees James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brothers there, who were in the boat mending their nets. And again, there's that word. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants there too and followed Jesus. What is going on? How would you do this? Think about what is that. Don't just gloss over this. You've read this a hundred times. I saw something this week that I had never seen before. How well do you think they really knew Jesus before he, they jumped up and followed him? A scripture doesn't give us a whole lot of background, but it's probably not much. I'll tell you this, though, with the way he came up and said, follow me. I bet they had a sneaky suspicion. If they dropped those nets, they were in for an adventure of a lifetime. Things were going to change. There's, there's so much hidden gold right here. Y'all want to see? You ready for your hidden nuggets? Most people miss this. See, Mark is using his favorite word here. He used it twice. Anybody know which one it is? We kind of singled on it. He used it twice. It's five syllables. <laughs> Thank you. Immediately. Immediately. And immediately. He uses this over and over. Mark's known as the immediate gospel. We got to go. Let's go. Let's go. We, gotta, we don't got time. Shake and bake. We got to go. He is all about action. That's what I love about Mark. He says immediately. Notice there was no discussion. They didn't look at each other and go, hey, should we talk to dad about this? Maybe we should take a poll. I don't know if the majority is going to like it. None of that. Jesus calls, and they left. Boom. Immediately. James and John even had their dad sitting with them in the boat. There's no mention that they looked at dad and said, hey, dad, is this okay with you? Can we, can we do, should we do paper, rock, scissors? Should we stay? We go? It says they immediately left, and there's something else that most people didn't, I didn't get this till this week, I'm so, y'all, we're Bible nerds together, this is so cool. When you dig deep, how did we miss old Zeb sitting in the boat? Zebedee is sitting there in the boat, that's their dad, not a stranger, Zeb's sitting there, he's been in his nose, and Jesus says, well, what, my two boys just got away? Not only that, but there's other people in the boat, who else is in the boat? Hired servants. We never talk about those poor guys. Who has the ability to hire servants? Wealthy people. How did we miss this? The fact that Zebedee's sitting in a boat, he's got his boys over here, hired servants over there. Y'all, only rich people could afford hired servants to go fishing. 
this tells you something. This is such a hidden goal. Think about what they're giving up. This means Zebedee was doing pretty well. So that means James and John, if they are going to drop their nets, y'all, they are going to leave a very comfortable lifestyle. They've got it made. Mommy and daddy taking care of them. It is awesome. And this strange man comes up and says, hey, drop your nets. Follow me. Let's go. And they did it immediately. So you know I got to ask, what about us? Would we follow Jesus immediately like that? Some of us did. When we heard that Holy Spirit tug, we knew, I'm in. I'm all in. Maybe some of us are fighting that. Maybe some of us are toes in, half in. You put your whole toe in, you put your whole. Now you're going to sing that all day. Shake it all about, right? I know you do. Okay, all right. They were all in. Y'all, this, this blows my This kind of shames us with how we flirt with the world. We're like, we're moderately in. Jesus, I'll give you everything. I will go this far for you. You know, I'll give you everything. I surrender all, but not that. Not, the, not that. That's my precious, right? You all know what it is. There's something in your life that maybe you're guarding, maybe you're holding on to, that God says, can I, can I have you surrender that to me? Would you, would you just turn it? That's not meant for you. God is breaking some chains. Y'all know we had a, a young man accept Christ last night at Winter Jam. It's incredible. Another, another one last Sunday. Incredible. What God is doing. He is breaking chains. He is shattering addictions. We just sung about that. That is not a boring life. That is a life of, of the unknown, of adventure. And it is challenging. God is wanting to show Christ through you to a hurting world. You're supposed to be the light. You're supposed to be the one with the lifeline, throwing it out to all these people on the high seas who are drowning. All around us. What do we do? We take the lifeline and we make a little boat out of it. <laughs> Instead of a battleship, we're like the SS Minnow, just going on a two-hour tour. It's great. It's comfortable. Come on in. My, my chairs are padded. We've got air conditioning. Not enough for me. Today's about self-inventory. If last week was getting to know the Savior, today is what does it look like to really live for the Savior? What does it mean to love God and love people in a world, let's be honest, that doesn't really want to hear it? On the surface, you dig deeper, and they're hurting, and they're hungry, and they want desperately someone to show them peace and purpose and a reason to get out of bed. And that's our next challenge. Our next point, Christianity offers the adventure of extreme challenge. It's not for the faint of heart. We forget this, y'all, but Jesus' first disciples, they faced astronomical challenges. They left their jobs. They bailed on their careers. Some left their homes, some without even telling their families. To go with a person they had barely known, hardly known, maybe never even met, to go do something to some unknown place for some unknown length of time without even knowing exactly what it is they're going to do. Who's with me? Would you follow? That is a horrible recruitment advertisement. Come with me. No money. Not going to tell you. We're not going to tell you where you're going. I'm not even going to tell you what it's going to be about. I think we're going to fish for men. That's about it. It's going to be cryptic. Come with me. And they did. All right, is this blowing anyone else's mind? When we think about put yourself in their shoes, they had so many challenges. Would you do that? They had no money, no security, no shelter to sleep in at night, not even a sleeping bag. They would face so many things, not only that they had never seen before, but they were about to face things they never even imagined. You want to talk about a life of a challenge and adventure. Jesus is calling them to give up everything for the cause of the kingdom. They were calling to be disciples, and so are we. You know what the word disciple means? It means to be a devoted follower. You could be a follower of something or someone. You could be a disciple of Tom Brady or Willie Nelson or Kim Kardashian. Or insert. See, the word disciple itself doesn't have any holy connotations unless you are a disciple of someone that is holy. And that changes everything. When you look at Jesus, when we say we are disciples of Jesus, it means we follow him, not about the way we dress, not about the way we do our hair or how many tattoos we have or any of that. It's how we live our lives. And there's so many great examples of Jesus going and calling others, and every one of them followed immediately. One of my favorites, Matthew, great name. Jesus went and said, Matthew, stop collecting taxes. Come with me. This dude had it on Easy Street. He made so much money being a tax collector. And Matthew gets up, 
puts his clothes sign on the thing, and walks immediately. There's that word again. He immediately follows him. Jesus called his followers to give up everything. And I look around at us, and I wonder if we do the same. There is no holding back when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus. Aren't we called to a life of faith that forces us to live boldly when we face extreme challenges? Jesus doesn't call us to play it safe. He calls us not just give up a portion or give up 10% or 20% or 80% of our life. He wants it all. Our brothers and sisters overseas, y'all, they're living this out every single day. I've seen it with my own eyes. When I was doing missionary work over in Romania and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and all those communist countries where God was outlawed, you look into their eyes and they were just dead, so hopeless. I read a story about Pastor John Oros, who was a church leader over in Romania during the height of the communist era. I think it was during the Ceausescu regime. Some of you know history. You know how brutal that was. And he said this, during this time of communism, many of us were preaching in underground churches, and people would come up to us at the end of these services, and they would say, thank you. I have decided to become a Christian. Check out what he told him. He said, that's great. I'm glad to hear you want to become a Christian, but I want to tell you first, up front, there will be a heavy price to be paid. This is not some easy believism. Why don't you reconsider what you want to do? Because many difficult things can happen to you. You can lose everything. He said a vast percentage of those people said, I'm counting the cost. I hear you. And they would go and secretly meet for months, two, three, four months at a time, learning the ways of Jesus, being privately mentored under the penalty of jail and death in these home churches. And they would have a larger home where they would come about this size and they would sneak into this room and they would hear the gospel. And after months and months of going over the basics of the faith, at the end of this period, these people were still coming up to Pastor John Oros. And they said, I hear it all. And now I want to not only follow Christ, I want to publicly declare it and follow the Lord in baptism. And again, he would push them off. He would say, that's great that you want to follow Christ and that you want to make your faith public through baptism. But I want you to count the cost because when you do this, you are giving your public testimony to follow Jesus. And I want to tell you, there will be informers in the crowd tonight. They will be seated amongst us as friends and they are there simply to take down your name tonight so that your life is over tomorrow. They will go and report to the authorities. So you count the cost because I want to be up front to say Christianity is not easy. As the days grow darker, it is not easy. It is not cheap. You will be demoted. You can lose your job. You will lose friends. Your neighbors will turn on you. You can have your kids turn on you. And you probably will lose your life. Still want to follow Jesus? Imagine his joy when he writes, with tears filling their eyes, they said, if I lose everything but my personal relationship with my Lord Jesus, it will still be worth it. Wow. What incredible faith. I don't know whether to stand in awe of their faith or to hang my head in shame that we don't see that faith on display more in our area powerful. The call to discipleship can be a call to face extreme challenges and hardships. Eyes wide open, church. Are you ready for it? Don't think the persecution in the dark days will always stay overseas. We know how the story ends. Before it ultimately gets better, it gets worse. How committed are you? We don't, we don't like to talk about that. It's uncomfortable. Well, it, don't you want to know the truth? I do. I want someone to be wide open. You tell me. You tell me the truth, I'll decide. Just, just lay it out there for me. Think about their testimony. This is what is in store for us. There are extreme hardships coming for those who follow Christ. And I'm wondering more and more if we have sugarcoated everything and made everything sound so easy. Some easy believism, you know. But, but what Jesus is calling us to is anything but easy. But it is so worth it. When you stand for Christ, he gives you supernatural power to not only withstand the heat and the fiery darts of the enemy, but to, to accomplish his will through us. You are used as a tool in his hands. And that leads us to the next one, the adventure of a supernatural experience. 
the adventure of supernatural experience. This is another thing we don't realize. Think about this. More than likely, before Jesus called these disciples, they had probably never seen a miracle. Think about that. They had probably never even seen, they'd heard about them. But what were they, they were about to walk a road of living supernatural event after supernatural event. Jesus was about to blow their doors off daily. And some of these supernatural experiences that they were having, y'all, they were downright freaky. Now, here's a couple of them right here. Keep reading in Mark. Look at verse 23. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Right? You just picture this evil voice. Have you come to destroy us? Isn't that creepy that this one voice refers to himself in the plural? Is it there are multiple demons? This is so, think about, put yourself there. There's been, standing up in the middle of a church service, someone beginning to shout this. Can you imagine how disruptive, how frightening that would be? You've never seen this before. We're used to seeing it. We hear these stories. We know them. We're like, ooh, spooky story. They're living it. So they shout out, what have you, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. They even know who Jesus is. They know about his high priestly role, what he's about to do for us. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent. Come out of him. And they obeyed. The unclean spirit convulsing him, right? Just going crazy, crying out with a loud voice came out of him. Can you imagine the disciples seeing this for the first time? Man, you want to talk about freaky. How shocking. Here's this guy. He's probably flopping around, convulsing, maybe foaming at the mouth as they often did. Maybe using that creepy, scary, guttural voice. Who are you? The Holy One of God, right? Now think, we don't picture ourselves how that is. You know what we do? We think of it as like Obi-Wan Kenobi narrating in some refined British accent. Oh my, that must have been quite a soiree. <laughs> No, it was horrifying. And they were seeing this supernatural event after supernatural event. They kept coming. Keep reading. Look at verse 29. And immediately, there's that word again, he leaves the synagogue and he goes to the house of Simon and Andrew. Oh, he's going to have a great bit of rest. Nope. Back up. Here's another miracle. James and John, you were there. Now Simon's mother-in-law is laying there ill with a fever. And immediately, they told Jesus about her. What does he do? Does he say, fever. I don't think I can handle that one. No. He goes to her, takes her by the hand, lifts her up, and the fever leaves her. And she begins to serve them. She starts, y'all, what an incredible, strong woman. Think about what she's, here she is, she's in bed, she's obviously quite sick, she's fighting a fever, maybe the flu, and then she jumps up and starts serving. Men, if this doesn't prove once and for all that the women are tougher than us, I mean, Let's be honest, if this, was a, if this was a guy in bed with the flu, we would think we're going to be dead by dawn, right? This is how we are. I can't make it. Is this what childbirth feels like? I can't imagine, you know. It's like, really? No, she was sick. She was in bed with a fever. She was feeling horrible, and Jesus comes in, and she's completely healed of her sickness. Don't you love Jesus? Shows up changes the day. Another freaky but awesome supernatural event. The disciples are witnessing this every day. They're seeing this, but most likely it's for the first time in their lives. And y'all, while I know this may not go on every day of the week, I also think it is wrong for us to dismiss these things and say God is no longer in the miracle working business. That is wrong. He is still the same God. He can still cast out demons. He can still heal. He can still part the sea in two as we sang about this morning. When we are living a life of adventurous faith, we will begin to expect supernatural occurrences to take place, not only in our lives, but in the lives of people around us. Are you seeing any evidence of supernatural activity, of God moving in your life? The next thing we see is the adventure of divine knowledge. Oh, I love this part. Divine knowledge. Good night. When I turn on the TV for five minutes, I see a nation who is desperately lacking biblical knowledge. There is a serious lack of divine knowledge. It is on full display, just any channel you want to look at, any movie. Anyone remember this guy right here? Anybody remember old Jay Leno? Ah, oh, I miss Jay. Jay had this segment called Jaywalking. 
basically it's a man on the street interview. He would go by and he would grab people unsuspecting, but you know, he wasn't trying to ambush them, but he'd have a microphone and he would ask them questions. Ridiculously easy questions. Questions that anybody should be able to answer. But they never could. And it was hilarious, right? We were all laughing, not with them. Oh, we were laughing at them. And we were watching this and we're thinking, please tell me you have, well, one night Jay Leno comes up and his topic is the Bible. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait for this. And he comes up and he, he's, he's at a college campus and first one are the two college age women. And he comes up and he says, hi, I'm, you know, I know who you are. Okay, he goes, can you name the 10 commandments? <laughs> just crickets. All right, tell you what, can you name five? Can you just name five. Can you name one of the Ten Commandments? She said, absolutely, I can. The first one, freedom of speech. True story. You can, just, you can watch it. Jay's like, no, for real? All right, I'll tell you what. Complete this sentence. Let he who is without sin, without missing a beat, she says, have a good time. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. Let he who is without sin have a good, what do you, what, what? There's a man who walks up, college campus looks at him and says, sir, how about you? Who, I'm going to give you an easy one. Who, according to the Bible, is famous for being swallowed by a whale or a great fish? And his answer was so confident. Without missing a beat, he's like, this is an easy one. Pinocchio. And he was serious. He was serious. Complete this sentence. When God closes a door, he opens a Chick-fil-A. I was like, no, for real? Is a lack of divine knowledge. They weren't really kidding. Most likely the early disciples, being devout Jews, they had a pretty good grasp of the Old Testament. They knew some things about Old Testament law, but they had never been faced with the kind of knowledge that Jesus was dropping. When he came up, he was changing the whole debate. Keep reading, Mark chapter 1, verse 21. So they go into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus enters the synagogue and was teaching. There he goes again. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who actually had authority. Not like those scribes. <laughs> Not like the Pharisees. He actually had authority. As God himself, he spoke with absolute, concrete terms. Y'all, they were being exposed to divine knowledge in a way they had never been exposed before. After this, Jesus, he cast out evil spirit. Check out how the witnesses react. Keep reading, verse 27. He says this. They were all amazed. And so they started questioning among themselves, saying, what's going on? What is this? A new teaching and with such authority. He commands even the evil spirits, and they obey him? See, when I'm talking about divine knowledge, I'm not talking about Bible trivia. I'm talking about divine knowledge. You have access to it. Don't answer out loud. How much time in the past week have you spent accessing the divine knowledge? I'm not waiting for the end for the challenge. We have the opportunity. We are speaking the very words of God. Do you all realize we get the authority to speak like Christ did? Because we're speaking his very words. At least we better be. I hope we're not changing them. I hope we're not part of a group that's refining it and editing it and making it new and now culturally sensitive so we don't hurt feelings. You all know how I feel about feelings. I want to be a lover of truth. Peter comes up and he says, guys, you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Living an adventurous faith is not for the weak. It means we accept the word of God. We live it. We speak it when he gives us the, the opportunity, this divine knowledge. We have the authority given by God himself, and we're called to share that message. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? In fact, why don't you sit back, put your pens down, put your phones down. We're going to take a little pop quiz, okay? Don't answer out loud. You can relax just for a second, just between you and the Lord. I want you to think back. All right? I'm not even going to put a time limit on it. When was the last time you shared the good news with someone? Okay. Take a moment. Go back to your mental Rolodex. Was it yesterday? Last week? 
Last year? Last decade? Never? <laughs> it's okay. There's time to fix that. We've all missed an opportunity. Ain't none of us got it all together. God's calling us to do better. Let me ask this. Make it a little, little easier. If you haven't shared the good news personally, when was the last time you at least loved someone enough to invite them to church with you? Or better yet, brought them? Last week? Last month? Last year? Last decade? And never. I want to I share with you a stat that blew my mind. Actually, it hurt my feelings. There was a stat that came out, a recent survey of 10,000 people asking, how did you come to know the Lord? What was it that led you to the Lord and to church? You ready for this? The answer is, this it won't add up to 100% because I'm only going to hit a few of them. One of them, I came because I had a special need and the church could meet it. 2%. I came because I saw the signs, the banners. I wanted to come be a part. I was a walk-in. 3%. I came because the pastor invited me. 6%. I came because of a visitation or an outreach program, 1%. Yikes. What a different world. I came because I liked your Sunday school and your small groups, 5%. I came because of an evangelistic program, 3%. I came because a friend or a relative invited me, 79%. Wow. Don't underestimate your power. Don't underestimate your influence. God is using you. He has the ability. You have a sphere of influence that no one else can reach but you. Y'all, we got to get fishing. We got to start reaching people that are in our pond. We have Easter coming up. I want to challenge you. This is an amazing stat that, that I, I see every year, and it says eight out of ten people who don't normally attend church will go on Easter if someone just invited them. Eight out of ten. Now, there is a spiritual openness. There is a hunger out there. Maybe you've been a believer so long, you don't remember what it was like without Christ. But if you can remember, it was dark. You didn't even really realize what you were missing, but you knew there was something more out there. Eight out of ten. So here's my challenge for you today. I want you to start praying for that person that you want to bring. At the end of service, maybe when we stand, we sing our final song, and the altar's open, maybe you want to come just lay their name at the altar before the Lord. Say, God, I'm crying out. Will you give me? Insert their name. Put them into my path. Let our paths cross. Give me that divine appointment. Will you give that to me? Use me as your tool in your hand. If you're not regularly crying out for a neighbor or a lost coworker or a family member, you are missing a boat. We can't be compassionate followers of Christ if we don't care. So how are you doing with that? You have a chance. Who is it? Maybe God's already put it on your heart right now. You don't have to wait till the altar. Start praying. Whisper that, that voice. Pray. God, open their hearts. Let the scales fall. Don't let them be blinded to lies from the enemy. Expect supernatural things to happen. If we truly love them, we will share with them. And that leads us to our final truth this morning. That's the adventure of true compassion. I love it. The adventure of true compassion. See, in that culture where the disciples lived, everyone had a measure of compassion, especially if you were devout Jews. But not until Jesus showed up did they understand what that really meant and how far compassion would go. You've heard it said, go with him a mile. I say, carry his load two miles. You've heard it said, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What? Jesus, you, I don't think you understand. You're, you, you meant to say, pray for your friends. He said, no, pray for, think about this. What he is showing up with is so revolutionary because Jesus had compassion. That's why he came to earth. Why was he casting out demons? He hated to see them controlled by evil spirits, missing what God had for them. Why did Jesus heal people's sicknesses? Because he had compassion on them. He hated to see their suffering. He wanted to bring glory to the Father. Just two weeks ago, y'all remember we talked about the leper? Couldn't even approach people. Unclean, unclean, go away. I can't even be near you. What Jesus do? We read in Mark, he goes up and he touches them. And he says, oh, I'm willing. Be clean. 
go. Jesus taught us that sickness, demon possession, death, our lost condition, this is not part of God's original plan, and he is here to remedy that. And it is coming when everything will be made new. Are your friends and neighbors ready? They ready for that day? When the trumpet blows, we're a day closer than we've ever been. Nobody can deny that. When we're living in adventurous faith, we begin to see these people that not just not just nameless, faceless people in the crowd. They're our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, those who are sick, those who are suffering. We have a chance to be loved, to be compassion. And we go to extreme lengths to help them as God gives us opportunity. When we think of the stories we've looked at today, I think the, the way God is calling us to be disciples in the modern world, it is hard to look at Christianity as boring or irrelevant or sterile. It's messy. It's hard. You're going to get bruised. You're going to shed some tears. But it is so, so worth it. These 70, 80, 90 years, what? They're a vapor for the real life that you will live. This isn't even the dress rehearsal. It's not even the warm-up for life everlasting. But the time to prepare for that is in this life. The time is now. I think of adventurous faith. There's so many people who miss it because they're wrapped up in their own little world. I get it. I used to be one. I have to fight my flesh to focus on my world and my problems every single day. So many people are wrapped up with their own little bundle, you know, only living for themselves while Jesus offers a life that's so much bigger. I read just this week, Benjamin Franklin had this quote, a person who's wrapped up in himself makes for a very small bundle. How wild is it that people are trying to break a world record that was set years ago, the world's biggest ball of twine up in Kansas by a guy named uh, Frank Stober. Y'all, he spent his entire life building this. Think about this. 1.6 million feet of twine. He spent his whole life doing that to have this record when another man comes along right afterwards named Francis Johnson, spends his work making a bigger ball of twine in Darwin, Minnesota. And not to be outdone, now there's a race and several people today are winding their ball of twine trying to see who can set the record. And it just makes me think how sad it is so many people are spending their lives, spending their possessions into larger and larger bundles only to leave them behind. No legacy, no spiritual heritage, not taking anyone with them when they go. When Jesus says, I have so much more for you. He lived and died for us. Now he's depending on you as disciples to live and die for him. So what's it going to be? You all in for the adventurous life? The adventurous calling. Let's pray about it. Would you bow with me right where you are? Just close your eyes. No one being distracted. Tune out all the distractions. If you're watching later online or at home, just pour your heart out to the Lord. God, I pray now during this moment that you would reveal to us the adventurous life you've called us to. What is it you have for us? God, show us that pond you want us to fish. Show us the person we need to love. Show us the modern day equivalent of a leper that we need to not be scared of, to lay hands on and to pray for them. God, who do we need to show compassion to? Father, I pray you would put a, a person on our heart in this moment that doesn't know you, but you know that our paths will cross. God, would you just orchestrate that divine appointment? Would you go ahead and plan it? Help us to not miss it when it comes. Help us not to be distracted or focus elsewhere. God, let that path cross. Help us to speak your truth. Help us to be full of compassion and love and divine knowledge. To tell them we're just one hungry person, telling another where we found free food that's already been paid for. Lord, I thank you for your presence today. I thank you for your word, that it cuts deep every time we read it. And it's exactly what we need. We love you. We pray in your powerful name, Jesus, always. Amen and amen. If you're new here, you know what we like to do. We like to have one last time where we stand and we worship together. The altar will be open. You'll see people coming and praying. No one will bother you. If you want to come and kneel, it's just something special sometimes about the good old-fashioned altar. Maybe you just want to pray right where you are. That's awesome too. Just be obedient to what God's 
laying on your heart. That's it. That's it. You're in a safe place. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar's open. Just be obedient to what God's laid on your heart.